Good morning, Marshall Reddick investors, and thank you so much for joining us today from your desk or your couch or wherever you may have the luxury of sitting at the particular moment. This is Kristen Tabar. I am a realtor and advisor with Marshall Reddick Real Estate, and I will be your hostess with the mostest today. I'm really excited to be doing this presentation on how to buy investment property. It's one of our most popular events amongst not only our new clients, but also some of our seasoned investors, just for a refresher, uh, kind of get back into the basics. And today you guys are in for a real treat because not only are we going to be talking through all the ins and outs of investment real estate, but we're also going to hear from our tax specialist, Tony Watson from Robert Hall and Associates. He is our preferred tax accountant, specializes in real estate and works with a lot of our clients on how to properly prepare their taxes when they own property to make sure you're getting those write-offs, make sure that everything is filed appropriately. And real estate really goes hand in hand with taxes and tax savings. And we are gonna learn about that today. Tony's going to talk to you guys a little bit first before we jump into the rest of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Tony Watson. Great, thank you, Kristen. And, and once again, uh, to everyone attending today, uh, I just want to to let you know that that uh, you know everybody right now that the everything that's going on in the world, uh, just our prayers and our thoughts, and uh, they they go out to all of the families that that have been impacted directly or indirectly even by uh, by the pandemic and any of the social injustices that are going on in the world today. Uh, our hearts and our prayers go out to you. Uh, and just just make sure that you keep your head on your shoulders, that you keep moving forward and keep uh, the goal in mind as to coming out of this pandemic with a better understanding of how to uh, of how to retain this success that you've educated yourself with and and build wealth coming out of this pandemic, because it will end. Uh, I know that it seems like it won't end because it just keeps going on and on and on, but it will end. We will come out the other side stronger than ever and hopefully a little bit smarter uh, and a, a little bit more educated because we're taking the necessary steps uh, to educate ourselves during this time. Uh, so once again, my name is Tony Watson. I really appreciate Marshall Reddick and Kristen and everybody with the Marshall Reddick team for including us in today's webinar. Uh, we love doing seminars with uh, with their, their company and we've We've known each other for quite some time, so I'm very excited to be here and for all of the attendees today to to listen to not only my my short presentation, but also uh, what Kristen is bringing to the table today. So uh, thanks again for including us today for the first you know, 15, 20 plus minutes. I'm going to be talking about the power, actually not even 20 minutes, uh, the power of ink. We're going to briefly discuss the entity structuring and the importance of entity structuring during times of economic uncertainty. Obviously, right now, the world is a very interesting, strange, unique place uh, to be. And, and, and the United States is going through its uh, its ups and downs, its ebbs and flows. But like I said, on the other side of this pandemic, we will come out the other side hopefully stronger than ever, more united than ever. Uh, and the one thing that we all need to be aware of is that as time progresses, uh, taxes and finance and, and everything else in the world, the world continues to spin, right? And so I'm here to, to just shed some light on the wonderful world of taxation and how real estate uh, can be a nice tax shelter for you, as well as the benefits of utilizing an entity to shelter and protect those assets. Um, just a little bit of background of me real quick. I've been with Robert Hall for 15 years. I service roughly about 1,200 tax filings per year, uh, both personal and business, nonprofit, trust, estate, you name it, we file it. Uh, won a couple of, of great awards over the past, gosh, 15 years that I've been here. Uh, and we also, uh, I actually am the keynote speaker as well. And we, I speak at over 100 events per year on average, uh, now mostly on the digital platform. Uh, but I personally can't wait till we get back to the in-person seminars. I love shaking hands and meeting people face to face. Uh, we do service tax filings in all 50 states. Uh, that's why we we work really well with Marshall Reddick and their team because they're just in so many different places across the U.S. now expanding and teaching people about the benefits of real estate and investing and how to grow wealth in the real estate industry. Uh, so if you have any questions about out-of-state taxation uh, and how you should incorporate in other states to protect those assets that you're purchasing, we can absolutely advise across the U.S. In fact, we do have clients in all 50 states. 
Uh, just a number of services that we do offer aside from tax preparation. We do internal auditing, bookkeeping, payroll services, accounting, financial planning, estate planning, and also incorporating. And our go-to real estate investment firm is Marshall Reddick. So when you when you talk to us about the tax side of things, we give you all the information and we show you how, how cash flow and how the dividend paying benefit of real estate investing works. And then Marshall Reddick's going to help you find all of those properties and make sure you park yourself into something that is truly a cash flowing uh, and long term appreciating asset. Right now, our phones have been ringing off the hook for a number of reasons. One, to talk about the CARES Act and all of the potential changes coming up in 2020 and 2021. But one other very, very important topic and, and a, a very common phone call that we're having nowadays is about asset protection. Clients are calling and saying, well, I want to make sure that I'm secure. I want to make sure that I'm insured. I want to make sure that all of my assets that I'm purchasing or have purchased in the past are protected. And they don't know what entity to use for each investment that they currently own. And so one thing that we've really focused on with our clients is explaining to them in detail the differences between the trust the LLC, the S-Corp, the C-Corp, and obviously insurance policies. Uh, a lot of clients say, well, Tony, I don't think I need an entity because I have a great insurance policy. Just understand that insurance is there and in place to pay out a settlement in case an unforeseen event happens. And that makes insurance the most important thing for you to have as an investor, as a property owner, as a self-employed business owner, okay? But an insurance policy does not provide you the same benefit as an entity. Uh, insurance, once again, is there in place to pay out settlements in case an unforeseen event happens, and it has a value, a cash value to it. But, and I usually ask this in our in-person seminars, but I would ask you right now, if we were face-to-face, -face, you know, just by a show of hands, how many people think that insurance companies are in the business of paying out settlements, right? Kind of a silly thing to think about because we all know that insurance companies, they're not the wealthiest businesses on the face of the planet because of paying out settlements, right? They're wealthy and the most, they're the most valuable companies because they retain a lot of their wealth and they don't pay out every single insurance claim. And so insurance might protect you left and right in, in certain ways, but insurance policies do not separate business and personal assets. So the benefit, benefit of having both the LLC or the S Corp, as well as the insurance policy could give you that added layer of asset protection that you really are looking to, to get. Uh, and number one, number two, it also provides a much greater level, in my opinion, of peace of mind. You wanna make sure that as you grow wealth, you are able to retain wealth and also protect yourself from potential litigation and any potential uh, lawsuits that are against you where, uh, you know, a cash payment has to be made uh, to settle. Uh, so insurance policies, like I said, they are great to have, but they do not offer the same benefit as incorporating. Now, there are a lot of choices for us to, to choose from when picking an entity, but in, and from a legal perspective, an attorney will probably pitch the LLC before any other entity type. But I want to make sure that before we, we jump into some other detail about the entity structuring, I want to make sure that we talk about how California views LLC filing fees, specifically California. Okay. LLCs here in the state of California, they file a or they pay a filing fee based on its gross revenue, based on the LLC's gross revenue, not the net profit. So I've kind of mapped this out for you. Assume that you're, you know, 15 or 20 rental properties that you've acquired over your lifetime. Assume that when you add up all of the gross rents, let's call your gross rent number a million bucks. And then you have 900,000 in mortgage interest and in property taxes and in insurance and in depreciation and repairs, improvements, all of that stuff combined. And your net profit is only at about $100,000 per year, soon to be much greater because somebody else is paying for the debt for you, right? But let's assume that this is the scenario right now. California's filing fee for, through an LLC is based on the gross revenue amount, not the net revenue amount. So when you jump into the entity structure or the conversation of having an entity structure, you need to understand, number one, yes, you get, get great asset protection through this entity, but you also need to be aware of the financial obligation you tie yourself into with the state of California and other states. California happens to have the fi highest filing fee across the U.S., but other states do have filing fees. They're just much less. 
Uh, Nevada, sometimes I think it's like a $75 uh, fee per year, sometimes as low as $35. And then you have to have a resident agent for service of process. Uh, in Delaware, depending on the election that you make of how to be taxed, you can either be taxed based on your assets or based on the shares issued out of the business. So each state has its own individual tax code. And that's what makes Robert Hall and Associates unique is that we know a lot of this stuff. So, um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and pretend to know 100% of everything, but if for some reason you throw me a question and it stumps me, my job is to research it and get you back an answer uh, as quickly as possible. So, you know, try, try us out, send us questions that you have, some, some concerns that you have uh, on the tax side of things, and we'd be more than happy to uh, do a little bit of research for you and get those answers to you. But before you jump into this on the California side, understand that California is going to look at that gross revenue amount and force you to pay the filing fee, not the tax, but the filing fee based on your gross revenue. You can go elsewhere and incorporate for greater asset protection, but not for tax benefit if you are a California resident. So some people today uh, in today's webinar, you might not actually be California residents. You might be living outside of the, the state of California. And in that fact, you can go elsewhere in the US and incorporate sometimes even for the tax benefit. But let's assume for just a, the moment that most of the attendees today are California residents. California is unique, we all know this, and that's why California taxes its residents on their worldwide income. So you very much could go to Nevada, Delaware, uh, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Florida, Alaska, and incorporate an LLC or a corporation there in that state, but it will not be for a tax benefit. It will only be for asset protection uh, because at one, an LLC provides no tax benefit. Two, when you incorporate elsewhere in the US because of California's tax code, they will force you to pay the same filing fee in the state of California because you, the owner, reside here more than 51% of the time throughout the year. So just understand that there may still be some tax implications and some filing fee implications here in California, even though you're investing outside of the state of California. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. It is not a corporation. In fact, LLCs do not file articles of incorporation. They file articles of organization. So just be aware that when you are telling somebody that you're incorporated, understand that you know, an LLC, yes, by all means, it's an incorporated entity, but it does not file articles of incorporation. So don't ever tell somebody that you are a corporation if you're an LLC. Uh, you might be in breach of malpractice. So from a legal perspective, just be aware of what type of entity you have set up and, and how you, uh, how you uh, relay the type of entity or relay that information to an opposing party. So just be, just be aware of that. Uh, moving forward, you know, obviously the LLC is happens to be the most popular entity structure, and it is for, uh, the most popular from an asset protection standpoint for a number of reasons. Uh, it can hold large assets and protect those assets separately from everything that you individually own personally. Okay, so let's say I own my primary residence, I have a 401k, I have some inherited property, my spouse owns some investments and, and has some assets. Well, those are all personal assets until I take those business ventures and separate them from my personal social security number. And when I incorporate as an LLC or when I incorporate as a corporation, I am assigning this asset or this business venture its own identification number. And so LLCs are the most popular for rental investments because one, there are large depreciable assets. Two, you want those large valuable depreciable assets to be separated from all of your personal liability. So the LLC hands down is the go-to entity. If any entity is an option, the LLC should be the one for your long-term rental investments. And unlike the S corporation where the LLC provides great limited liability protection, but no tax benefit, the subchapter S corporation could provide you not only the asset protection benefit, but also a tax benefit. However, when you talk about rental investments versus self-employed businesses, those two types of ventures need to be looked at differently when choosing the type of entity that you'd like to incorporate as. The subchapter S corporation is great for self-employed businesses, but not great for rental properties. And, and just as a side note, remember that rental income, it pays federal and state income tax, but it never pays self-employment tax. And so therefore an LLC, if it's not gonna save you any tax, but it is gonna create greater liability protection for large assets, property, rental property, always better in an LLC than an S corp. When you transfer a property to an S corporation, a couple things happen from a tax perspective. One, you're kind of telling the IRS at that point that your rental property is a self-employed business and not just a rental property cash flowing asset. So 
at the end of the day, the IRS may require you at some point to pay Social Security and Medicare tax on this cash flow if it is structured under an 1120S corporation. That, that, that's very unlikely, but it could potentially happen. The main reason why you never want to put rental properties in an S corporation is for the long-term tax implication that may ensue. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you buy a property under an LLC or not under an LLC. Let's say you buy a property personally and you put it immediately into an S corporation, not an LLC. When you capitalize a corporation, you are essentially trading that property for shares of the business. Let's say 10 years down the line, you decide that you want to take the property out of the corporation, not sell it, just take it back out of the corporation and maybe split it with a spouse or split it with a child or, or manipulate the partnership in some way. So you quick claim the deed out of the corporation. Well, the federal government doesn't view it as just a distribution of asset. They actually view that as a share, a, a, a sale of shares of a corporation. Because what you did originally is you traded the property for shares of a corporation. Well, over 10 years of appreciation on the property, Basically, those shares have grown, let's say, from a $500,000 amount up to a million dollar amount, even though you didn't sell the property. When you distribute that property from a corporation, you pay capital gain tax on whatever that appreciated value is. That's the main reason why you don't want to put property in an S corporation. LLCs do not play that game. So if you want to dive more into detail about that side of the equation when entity structuring it comes into play, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to Robert Hall & Associates. I'll give you our contact information at the end. Let's say that you're a property flipper or a property manager, and let's say that you're acquiring property and you want to start this property management business, now considering your business uh, as a self-employed venture. Let's say that your profit under an S corporation, because we talked about how the LLC doesn't save you tax, but the S corporation does. Let's assume that your profit under an S corporation would be about $100,000. Remember, as a sole proprietor LLC, no tax benefit, but under an S corporation, your property management company could significantly or see significant reduction in overall self-employment tax. And this is essentially how it works. When you're a sole proprietor or an LLC, no tax benefit. You pay literally the max tax across the board on this $100,000 profit amount. As you can see in the 25% average tax range, 9.3% state and 15.3% self-employment tax, you're losing a lot of money. You know, you're, you're just paying this obligation in tax, but it's more than the obligated amount that you should be paying. Under an S corporation, you get to take this $100,000 profit and split it into two numbers. But no matter how you split it, the profit is still $100,000. So nothing really happens to your federal or your state income tax number. But look what happens to the amount of self-employment tax that you pay. It drops by nearly 60% because you are no longer subject to self-employment tax on the full $100,000, are you? If you're required to pay yourself a salary as an S corporation, you get to split it 40% salary, 60% flow through profit. And essentially under an S corporation for a property management company, for a flipping company, for anybody who is generating self-employed revenue, this works great, for instance, just as a side note, works great for real estate professionals. So realtors selling property and making commission income, it reduces their self-employment tax by upwards of 60% because only the W-2, only the 40% salary is actually subject to self-employment tax. The 60% that's left over avoids, not evades, but avoids Social Security and Medicare tax. Just in this example on $100,000 profit, that's a total tax savings of about $9,100. Uh, you know, portion of, portions of it are tax deductible, so there may be a slight adjustment, but you kind of get the picture that as an S corporation, you could significantly reduce the amount of self-employment tax that you pay on the federal Social Security and Medicare levels. Even at $50,000 of yielded profit, you're still saving just shy of about $5,000 in tax savings. So financially speaking, at this level of profit, even at $50,000 of profit, it makes sense from a financial perspective to operate as an S corporation versus an LLC or a sole proprietorship. And the way that you achieve this is by issuing yourself a W-2 because as an S corporation, you're no longer considered to be a sole proprietor, an LLC, or even a self-employed individual. You are considered to be an employee of your own corporation. So just remember that moving forward, there are some options for you. Corporations aren't only for the billion dollar corporations, billion dollar businesses of the world. Corporations can very much give small business owners a benefit as well. 
but it is all about how you operate them. And, and your tax advisor, your tax preparer, whoever is helping you file each year, they should know the ins and outs of the entity structure and which may benefit you the most. Uh, once again, LLC, no tax benefit, S corporation tax benefit, but S corporation should not be for rental properties, whereas the LLC should be the only entity ever used. If you are going to choose to, to incorporate, the LLC should be the only entity used for holding title to long-term assets under. Okay. Um, just to re remind you that that 40% reasonable salary, let's say that your profit is a hundred thousand bucks minus your $40,000 salary leaves you with that $60,000 profit. And that 60 K is what flows through to you individually free from paying social security and Medicare tax. You still pay federal and state income tax on the 60 K, but what you're avoiding in this scenario is that nasty 15.3% of social security and Medicare tax on $60,000. Obviously, I you know, crammed a lot of information into a very short period of time here. Uh, it's very important for you to sit down with a tax advisor and map out a strategy that is customized and fine-tuned for your situation. Do not go to your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, your parent for tax advice unless they are a licensed tax advisor. Go to the people who spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours per year educating themselves on the current and old revenue code. 2020 has been a very unique year. So we've seen more new clients this year than ever before. And that's me. I, I think that we attribute that success to the fact that we educate ourselves year round. Once the CARES Act came out, we spent days. I mean, I'm talking about 15, 16, 17 hours, a couple of days in a row, learning the ins and outs of the CARES Act so that we could bring the most up-to-date information to our current clients and our prospective clients. Uh, and so that when we joined up in seminars with Marshall Reddick and with other uh, other vendors that we, that we do business with, that we were bringing correct and updated information to their clients as well. And that's why over the past 10, 11 years, I've been here 15 years, but the past 10 or 11 years, we've offered free consultations. And some of the benefits of those free consultations are number one, we'll review previous year's tax returns, figuring out if anything was missed. And if they, if something was missed, we go ahead and amend. In fact, yesterday, I just talked to a, a client of mine or a new client that we picked up for through a free 30 minute consultation. And we realized that in 2018 and 2019, that there was a limitation on the amount of deduction that they were taking for their rental real estate investments. And they're real estate professionals, which means that if the election was made properly, there shouldn't have been a limitation to this deduction. So of course we went back and amended it and now they're gonna get back close to $25,000 in refunds. That's a pretty darn big mistake, right? I think that you could all, we, we would all agree on that. And it's simply by making the correct elections on the return. Now, you don't want to go back and amend anything if you can't prove without a doubt that this is the correct election to make. I would never even suggest to amend returns. But through these free consultations, there's a second set of eyes on the return, number one. Number two, if we can find something to save that client money that another preparer didn't see, uh, we'll go ahead and make that correction hands down. No, no, no questions about it. Also, part of the free consultation, we add you to our periodic tax email updates, letting you know about some of the changes coming up uh, towards the end of the year. Once again, 2020 is unique. We have an election coming up in November. We've got the CARES Act. We potentially have a second round of financing for EIDL, for PPP, for all of the relief uh, programs that CARES Act introduced. There's gonna be a lot of changes this year. So just make sure that you're educating yourself as much as possible, and most importantly, working with the right professionals. And that's why we team up with people like Marshall Reddick uh, to make sure that our clients and their clients, they are surrounded by like-minded individuals and also professionals that have answers to some very, very important questions uh, and concerns that they may have during these uncertain times. If you know for a fact that you'd like to sign up for a free consultation before I hand the, the, the baton back over to Kristen, uh, you can visit www.roberthalltaxes.com forward slash consult or call 818-242-4888 and speak with our marketing department. They'll know exactly where to direct you once you call in uh, to sign up for that free consultation. I will also send my information in the chat box. So you'll have my email, you'll have the roberthalltaxes.com forward slash consult, and you'll have our phone number. Reach out whenever you'd like. Uh, we are here to help and assist uh, and, and to kind of wrap up. Everybody is, you know, I, my, my heart's, like I said, my heart's and our prayers go out to the individuals impacted by the pandemic. Make sure that you're staying safe, stay healthy. If you're staying home, stay home. Uh, but most importantly, stay fit, both in mind and body. 
uh, and, and make sure that you understand that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Do not think that this is gonna last forever, even though we've been in this together for six, seven months now, this will end and coming out the other side, knowing a little bit more than what we knew going in, I think that that will lead to nothing but success stories in the future. So, uh, Kristen, I'm going to toss it back over to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. You're in for a real treat, and uh, and we hope to talk with you uh, with you soon. Thank you so much, Tony, for being on with us today. It's always a pleasure to present with you. It's one you know you're one of my personal favorites to. Uh, to uh, present with, and I really hope that we can get back to doing these in person, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and in the meantime, again, thank you so much, Tony. And we are going to jump now into how to buy how to buy investment property. So I know that we're uh, almost halfway up on our time. I know some of you may need to jump off at noon, but hopefully you can stick around till the end. We'll do some Q and A at the end. Um, if we haven't gone too far over. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, if this is your first Marshall Reddick presentation, um, I wanna welcome you. Thank you so much for taking that step and joining us for this presentation. Marshall Reddick Real Estate is a full service brokerage here in California. We help our buyers and sellers to buy and sell primary homes, rental homes. We manage those properties for them as well. And we help our clients to do that across the nation as well in 16 other markets, three of which we have our own offices in and we get to service our clients from start to finish and for the life of their investment. So ultimately the goal is to have our own brick and mortar office in each of our areas so that we can ensure that everybody gets the same quality service from you know, the moment that they give us a call until they decide ultimately to perhaps sell that property or keep it managed under our um, under our name for many years to come. I'm not going to read all of this to you guys. I'll let you go ahead and do that for yourselves. But one of the reasons that we have such success and that our clients really like to work with us is because not only do we have so many services in-house as far as brokerage management and lending, but we also have teams and vendors that we've been partnered with for many years, including people like Tony Watson, who are at the top of their game, professionals in their markets and in areas of expertise, lenders, we have insurance providers, real estate attorneys, literally anybody that our clients could need in a transaction, pre-transaction, post-transaction, anybody that you need to talk to during the life of that investment property. Here's a little bit about me. I've been with Marshall Reddick for five years. Uh, my husband and I own 12 units across the country. And to date, I've worked on 306 Marshall Reddick transactions. Um, actually a fun story that I'll, I'll paraphrase since we're running a little low on time already. But uh, my husband actually went to high school with one of our owners, Scott Pastel, and so um, they had lost touch, got reunited at the 10-year high school reunion. We kind of got to talking about what everyone was up to these days. I had just gotten my license. Scott had just taken over the company that was helping people do exactly what Jason and I were doing as far as looking at rentals and starting to build a portfolio. So I uh, kind of, it was a match made in heaven as they say. And um, I, about a year later, an opportunity opened up for me to be able to join the company and, you know, hands down, I said, absolutely, I'm interested and the rest is history. So I've been really um, privileged to be able to, you know, practice what I preach and be able to, you know, help teach my clients and help my clients to basically do the same thing my husband and I have been doing for about the last 10 years. Um, here's a little snapshot of what I've done with the company. Um, many of the units that my husband and I own now, we've actually built from the ground up. I wouldn't recommend doing that as your first transaction, but like I said, we've been investing and familiar in this field for about 10 years now. So as you grow and build your portfolio, some other opportunities open up. And that's really what we want to do for our clients is teach you how to invest, how to evaluate properties, how to decide whether or not something is going to be a good fit for you, and then be able to kind of take that and run with it and be able to use your Marshall Reddick advisors, such as myself, for advice and guidance and create 
that portfolio that's going to give you your passive income, give you your early retirement, make you comfortable in your retirement if you're, you know, you've already planned that out. So we really want to give all of our clients the opportunity to use real estate as a tool to get to financial freedom. Here's a snapshot of my husband and I's portfolio. Um, for those of you out there who are just getting started, one property doesn't make you a millionaire. A, a portfolio is going to get you to that point where you're going to increase your net worth, you're going to increase your monthly income, you're going to increase your, um, you know, your overall opportunity to get to that place where you are free financially and you can retire and you can, you know, maybe step back from your day to day nine to five grind, if you will. Um, my husband and I have been working together to purchase for 10 years, the two, uh, 2004 and 2006 properties I like to call BC because they're before Kristen. Um, but as you can see, we've done purchasing, we've sold a couple properties, we've invested in private loans through Marshall Reddick Real Estate. So really it takes many, many years to build a portfolio that is going to give you some of those freedoms that I just mentioned a moment ago. So if you have any questions, want to learn more about what we've done, what that experience has been, I'm always open to sharing and I love you know, learning about other people's experiences and how they relate to mine and, and you know, how we can help each other kind of moving forward. Here's a quick table of contents of what we're going to cover today. We're going to really talk the, you know, A through Z of real estate investing. We're going to look at a couple of financial examples, um, kind of talk through how and why Marshall Reddick selects the markets that we're in currently and, um, open it up at the end as i mentioned for questions unless we run out of time in which case we will make sure to get everybody called and emailed after the presentation so that we can follow up and make sure that you've gotten all the info that you were hoping to get on today's show so if today is your first presentation or you've been reading you've been you know watching other podcasts you've been reading blogs um You've been kind of all over Google and this is you kind of feeling like, now what do I do? Well, Marshall Reddick as a company offers all of our clients a free consultation where we'll talk about what your goals are, talk about your experience and ultimately help you put together a plan for your investment portfolio, what markets work the best, what price range works the best. And that's going to coincide with a lot of our other team members as well. Um, as far as our lenders, if you need tax advice, that would include Tony as well. Um, and really get all of our clients to a point where they're able to kind of make a plan. I'm going to purchase every 12 months. I'm going to purchase every 18 months, et cetera, et cetera. And once we get through those steps of identifying the correct types of properties, looking into what markets make the most sense, introducing you to all the key players. Now you've got your team in place and now we're ready to get out there to start making offers and start building that portfolio. So we're gonna jump off with setting investment criteria. Um, and this is inclusive of many different items. We are gonna talk about what price is comfortable how much you have in your savings. You know, if you have a million dollars in the bank and you don't want to spend a million dollars on property, we're not going to do that. We're going to take the bits and pieces that you are ready to comfortably invest now and we're going to build up to that portfolio. So we're going to talk what types of properties you're interested in. What types of properties do you already own? Are you interested or willing in doing repairs? Do you want something that's already rented, that's already in rent ready condition? Um, all of these things are going to help to put together what types of properties and what markets we're going to look at. And it's also going to eliminate some other types of properties and markets based on your price point and based on what type of inventory we're looking at. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in the presentation. So your criteria is definitely based on your financial goals. Um, I'm not gonna read all these questions to you again. I, I hope that everybody who's on today can read. Um, <laughs> but what I do wanna do is, is give a couple of real examples. So I work with a lot of clients that are in their late 20s, early 30s, 
have been working professionals for many years. They have very good W-2 income and they're looking at starting to build a portfolio now so that perhaps they can retire early. And if they can't retire early, when they do retire, they're comfortable and they're prepared for that so that they have this, these properties kicking off a monthly income to them in addition to the 401k or IRAs or other uh, retirement type plans they have set up. So those clients may be looking at these uh, you know, properties that maybe are a little bit more expensive, properties that maybe don't kick off as much income to start with, but what they're looking for is that long-term appreciation, that long-term growth, and in the short term, they're looking for the tax benefit, right? If you make a lot of money, you get to write some of that income off with your real estate and in turn, pay less in, in taxes. So that strategy, may be different from somebody who's in their late 40s or early 50s who is looking for something that is going to kick off more of an immediate cash flow now because they don't have 30 years until they retire to let that property appreciate and increase rents and um, get get ready for retirement because they're much closer to that retirement age so they may be looking at the property that's going to kick off more of a cash flow immediately where they can start to see that income now and start preparing and saving that to use in junction with any other retirement accounts or plans that they have already set up. Um, so there's definitely different strategies and your, your financial goals are going to be unique to you than they are um, to you know me and my husband or you know Tony who I know owns rental real estate as well. Everybody's financial goals and criteria are going to be different. Um, your ability to purchase your buying power will be confirmed by a lender and then we'll know exactly what price point you can be looking at. And that scale down at the bottom of the screen that you see is our system of property rating. So you can see, you know, like I mentioned, my late 20s, early 30s client may be looking more towards the left side, maybe looking at that A class. My late 40s, early 50s clients may be looking more towards that C class for the difference in what those properties are going to provide. All right, so here's a more in-depth look at that property scale. Uh, this is going to be based on the median home price for single family homes in any given market. And this is going to be different for every single market. Um, it, you, and you can use this folks at home to determine what property class your own home um, may fall in where, where you live. So that number, that 100% right in between that AB, that is your median home price right there. So if you live in Orange County and the value of your home is a million five, you can figure out where on that scale you fall with the median home price in Orange County and determine, oh, I have an A class, I have a luxury home. That's going to apply anywhere in the nation. All you need to know is what that median home price is. So when we're working with our clients, if a client says I'm looking for an A class property, just know that that price point is going to be at the median or higher and that's, again, how we kind of determine what market works for each individual based on your price point and based on what property class you're most interested in looking at. All right, so how do we determine the median home price of any given metropolitan statistical area, which will henceforth be known as MSA? So the National Association of Realtors publishes this information quarterly and updates the median home price in every market. You can find this information on the Marshall Reddick website. You can also find this on the National Association of Realtors page. Um, that page is not quite as intuitive. It's a little bit more difficult to navigate, but it is possible and you do not need to be a member to use it. Um, but you can go in and you can look at the median home price of any given area so that if you are doing your own research, maybe you're interested in purchasing in the San Antonio area and you want to confirm that our information matches the NAR information, you are able to go up on their website, pull up the San Antonio market and confirm what they are reporting the median home price is 
in that area. And like I said, that's going to be across the board in all of the major metros where the National Association of Realtors provides this information. Let's dive a little bit farther into property class. Um, for those of you who have not already, I do highly recommend that you read the Reddick Property Rating ebook. All of our properties are classified based on the methodology in that ebook. And if you are thinking, I'm not really sure, does an A class or a C class work for me? I want cash flow, but I don't know. C, you know, a C class doesn't sound like it's what I'm looking for. I highly encourage you to read the book because it's going to go through how we land on the ratings, what that system is built on. And furthermore, it's gonna dive into this information you see on your screen, which is what type of tenant you're likely to have in any given property class. Now, I will give you a real life example. I own a property in Memphis, Tennessee. It's in an A-class neighborhood. The tenant in that property is a self-employed business owner has never missed a rental payment, keeps the place looking nice, treats it like it's his own, and has been there for about two, three years now. I never, I feel like no news is good news from my property management company. I don't hear any complaints. I don't hear anything about this particular tenant. Now, let's switch gears to a C-class property that my husband and I sold a few years back. And it was a, a duplex located in the Southwest Florida market. One side had tenants that were phenomenal. They did their own touch up paint. They kept the place looking clean. They kept it looking nice. Um, not your typical C-class type tenant. However, the rents were C-class rent and that's what these tenants were able to afford. So even though they kept the property up like an A-class tenant would, their income, their jobs and the rental amount, definitely C-class category. On the other side of this duplex, the tenants were very messy. They had cats, they threw their trash outside and then they wondered why they got raccoons rummaging through their trash. They wondered why they had all these feral animals you know, wandering around their property. That is the epitome of a C-class tenant. So if you are ever wondering if the property classes are are true, if they are really suited as a Marshall Reddick investor and someone who has purchased properties that have been rated in this fashion, they, in my experience, they have fit to a T. So I highly encourage you, like I said, to read the ebook, really get familiar and decide for yourself as an investor, what type of property you want to own. Here's a snapshot of maintenance and vacancy. So when you're when you're on our financial calculator and you start browsing properties, you're going to see that we account for estimated monthly expenses. This is going to be maintenance, vacancy, and we will include a leasing fee as well, which I'll get into a little bit later. But your property class is going to determine how much maintenance and how much vacancy we account for when we're doing those long-term financials. And you can see here the A class has the least amount of uh, maintenance and vacancy estimate, and the C class is going to have the most amount of those. And that's going to coincide directly with the, the scenarios I just explained. Your A class tenant is more likely to treat your property nicely, treat it like it's their own. And you tend to have less vacancy in an A class property because those tenants are more stable and um, tend to stay for a longer period of time. Um, an example that I usually like to give in person, which probably isn't fu as funny right now because you can't see me, but your A-class tenant, you know, has ha had a hard day at work and they decide to go home and unwind with a nice bottle of wine. And let's say that their glass spills over. Not only are they bummed that they spilt their nice wine, but they're also bummed that it's on the floor. And that person's going to say, you know, oh no, my wine oh no, my floor, and they're gonna go and they're gonna clean it up and they're gonna make sure that there's no wine stain on the carpet, that they haven't, you know, ruined anything in the home and, you know, kind of treat it as if it's theirs, right? Your C-class tenant, on the other hand, may be the one that's unwinding with a box of wine and spills it and says, ah, it's a rental. That stain on the floor doesn't bother me. So, you you know definitely think about what type of person as i mentioned before you want living in those properties um to 
give you an idea of how much, you know, what length of time, what 8% looks like. 8% um, vacancy is approximately one month. So on the financial calculator, we're gonna estimate about one month per year in vacancy. Obviously your tenants are gonna be signing 12 month leases. It's not likely that you're going to experience that much, but we wanna give you a conservative number to work with when you're determining the financial performance of your properties. Um, again, we use pretty conservative numbers for vacancy. Um, when calculating the future vacancy, I have clients that go all the way up to 10%, some people who use the current market on um, vacancy rate, um, it's really up to you. We default based on the ebook and our clients have the opportunity to change that number on the financial calculator to determine what they feel is more accurate for their own financial evaluations. Um, again, here's a vacancy example, kind of gives you an idea of how many days per year we are Estimating as far as expenses for vacancy and turnover, again, you're not likely to experience one month of vacancy every single year. In most of our markets, the uh, tenants on average tend to stay in a property for anywhere between three and five years. So, um, you know, that's a, a really great amount of time to have a tenant in your property. Um, I do on occasion hear about those, you know, lifetime renters. I wouldn't expect that, that's not what's probable, but um, it is likely you know, that sometimes you land on a tenant that's gonna stay maybe the whole time their kids are in school or you know, a little bit longer than that. Some people, I actually had one client tell me that their tenants told them they wanted to die in that house, which is, is funny, but I hope that that doesn't actually happen for many reasons that we won't get into right now. Um, but these are, part of Marshall Reddick's um, evaluation process is to be conservative so that we can deliver numbers that may be a little bit low, maybe you know a little bit on the extreme side as far as, far as conservation, but we do not wanna over promise and underperform. Here's what that Reddick property rating ebook looks like. It's about a 20 minute read. Like I said, very, very important to read this and understand it, especially um, you know, as part of your research, as part of your um, information gathering process while you're getting ready to look at properties, um, because it's really important to really understand what type of property you're purchasing and, and really what to expect for the life of the time that you own it. So let's jump now into where, because a lot of times our criteria will point us to a market and we want to know what our options are and how we pick those particular markets. So we wanna make sure that the markets check off these boxes. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I, we will get into as we go down, but um, we need strong a, a strong workforce. We need um, rental demand. You know, if people aren't renting in an area, then what good does it do you to own a property there? Um, if any of you, I usually would ask for a show of hands if we were live, anyone have driven from California to Las Vegas, but there's a long stretch of the 15 where there's a couple pockets of houses here and maybe a shopping center 20 minutes later and a couple more pockets of houses. And every time I drive through there, it doesn't matter, I'm 37 years old people and I've driven through, through this area to Vegas so many times in my life. Every time I drive by here, I think, who lives out here? Who wants to live out here in the middle of nowhere? So if I'm thinking that, I'm sure a ton of other people are thinking that too. And owning a home in that area might make sense if you're gonna live in it, but certainly not if you wanna try to rent it out because where's your rental demand? Who are you marketing to? So we really wanna focus on areas where there's a lot of work, where there's a lot of rental demand and where we have reliable folks to manage those properties for you. So in the event you do run into a vacancy, which you will in the course of owning a rental property, it can get re-rented quickly. And it, you, and that way that keeps you in the, you know, in the process of earning that income and not sitting vacant for months and months and months because there's no one to rent to because your home is in the middle of nowhere. 
So here's a quick picture of our markets. The green boxes indicate areas where Marshall Ruddick has our own employed agents, property management team, and offices. Uh, the markets where you do not see a green box are markets where we still work with our tried and true third party agents and management teams to assist our clients who are looking at buying or already own in those areas. Um, and what has been really exciting, as I mentioned a little earlier in the presentation about being able to have our own agents is that we really have the opportunity to connect and work with our clients through the life of their investment as opposed to getting to the point where we've worked on the transaction and we're at closing and now we have to start working with a third party property management team so really exciting to have these um agents and markets and building those relationships and um giving all of this opportunity to our clients where there's so many options for you to look at different markets for rental options now we want to target the suburbs of these major metropolitan areas so we want to stay here these are pictures of where we currently market or where excuse me where we currently manage properties in our offices so here you see san antonio and austin here's clarksville oak grove and orange county so we're in these major metro areas and we're in the suburbs for several reasons here's um a map for you guys to look at here and again this goes back to my previous story about driving through vegas we want to stick to the major metros and the suburbs of those major metros because we want to make sure there's demand for your rental property you have a much larger tenant pool in the large suburbs of the major metros um again we're going to see more employment options you're going to see the you know more of a chance of people moving there nobody's moving to the middle of nowhere unless they want to build a farm and start you know raising cows so most people who are looking at renting are looking at being close to their place of employment being close to their children's school being in one of these major areas where these five boxes on your screen are going to apply because that gives you as an investor the best chance of getting your properties rented out quickly and smoothly with the least amount of turnover and the least amount of time being vacant all right so diving in a little bit farther here are a few things that the suburbs of those major markets will offer um, if you're looking at targeting a three bedroom, two bath home, it's likely that that's going to attract a family. If you're in an A or a B class neighborhood and the school ratings are a little bit higher and you've got a family that's looking at moving or renting and they want to keep their kids at a certain school or they want to get into a home before their kids start school and allow their kids to go, you know, all the way through elementary school in the same with the same kids in the same neighborhood, make friends, plant, you know, uh, plant roots, whatever the case may be, um, those types of people, those types of renters are going to be looking in the suburbs, right? People, families with children don't want to live in areas with high crime. They don't want to live in a building that was built in the, you know, early 50s that's falling apart. So the, the suburbs of major metropolitan areas are going to offer many families many renters the opportunity to get into something that's maybe a little bit newer um, in a little bit nicer area whether that's an area that's already been established or or a new development it gives the options for people to kind of shop around and look at what they really want to uh, look at look at something that they really want to live in all right, so I'm gonna flip through these really quickly. Um, these are just some stats on our markets. You just saw there, San Antonio, Texas. Here's another quick snapshot, Cape Coral. Um, you know, a, a lot of the markets that we currently have teams in are really flourishing, are really strong investment areas. We have data packets on all of our markets. You can hop on the Marshall Reddick website and download those graphs um you know bullet points charts everything that you could possibly want to know about any individual area you're going to see in these market data packets 
So moving right along, we're going to talk a little bit about how and what method of purchase is right for you. Um, some people want to pay cash. Some people are looking at doing a 1031 exchange where they're selling one rental to get into another. The most popular way for many of our clients to purchase real estate is via conventional financing. If you're going to finance, I highly recommend you speak with a conventional lender to learn what your buying power is. You're going to get the best rates, the lowest down payments, and really the returns are going to be very favorable on that conventional loan. We work with CMG Financial. Reed Hazard, who you see on your screen, has been our preferred lender for over 14 years now. Um, he's licensed in every market where we help our clients to purchase property. So what does that mean for you? That means if you buy your first property in Texas and your next one in Florida and your next one in Tennessee, you get to work with the same lending team. And instead of providing all your documentation to a new lender every time, you get to update the information that they already have. The team knows you, the team knows, you, you know the team, and everybody works together so that you as the client get a seamless transaction each time with the same lenders. So that's one of the benefits of working with our, our team and getting connected to our vendors is that that's it. Now you're, you've created your team and you get to carry on and help you know, everybody gets to help you build the portfolio throughout the life of your um, investment partnership with us. So here's Reed's information. If you are interested in, you know, a HELOC, a cash out refinance, you're interested in getting pre-approved, you can call him. If you'd like to speak with me first or, or your advisor and kind of get a game plan together first, decide when is the right time to get approved, we can definitely do that. Um, what does getting pre-approved mean? Here are the steps for getting an approval with a lender. Um, of course, you fill out an application, you provide all your documentation, and guys, there's a lot of documents. As someone who's purchased several properties myself, every time I submit documents, I feel like there's more and more and more and more, and now especially with the lending guidelines that have changed a little bit as a result of COVID-19, there's some more stringent rules as far as people who are self-employed um, and that that's really added to the supporting documentation that needs to be provided. That said, um, as I mentioned, you're gonna get the best rate and the best terms with a conventional loan. So once all your document gets, once all your documentation gets provided, you'll have your pre-approval. And once you have that pre-approval, you're ready to make offers. Your pre-approval is ready good for four months. So if you're ready to start making offers, we have four months on that pre-approval letter. Once that expires, as I mentioned before, it's really easy to update that information and uh, you know, get back on the horse as far as making offers on your properties. If you have questions again about lending, please reach out to me. Let me know. We can get connected with Reed and answer anything additional. Um, wanted to get through this a little quickly. As I mentioned, we still have quite a bit to get to and um, we're a little short on time. So how do we protect ourselves? Tony talked a little bit about insurance policies. Um, you definitely need to insure your rental property. You wanna protect yourself. Um, not to mention if you do end up getting financing, your lender is going to require that your home is insured. So the insurance policy is going to protect you from any unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen, you know, weather, disasters, anything like that, and ensure that your asset is protected. So just as we have our preferred lender, we have our preferred insurance providers. This is Michael McAllister and Stan Druckmann. They have also been working with Marshall Reddick Real Estate for several years. And you know what I really love about them is that they'll they'll sit down with you, they'll talk to you about what kind of premium you'd like, what kind of coverage you want, you know, what do you want your deductible to look like? And then furthermore, they'll go into looking at what other assets you have insured, your own primary home, your vehicles, and if there's a way that they can bundle that and help you to save money on a monthly basis with all your insurance policies, 
they will do that as well. So um, definitely, I encourage you know anyone who's out there in in the midst of a transaction or putting the teams together. I highly would recommend reaching out, having a conversation, um, because insurance is definitely an important part of keeping yourself and your assets protected. All right, so let's talk returns. A lot of people out there are evaluating properties based on the financial performance, which you should, and we're gonna talk about what that looks like. So we're gonna start here in Clarksville, Tennessee. As you can see, Clarksville is a very steady eddy market, uh, lower median home price at 158.5, and the market doesn't do much in terms of movement. It's very, very slow, very steady, and that's one of the reasons that our clients really like to invest in this market. Not only that, but on a rent to purchase price ratio, it tends to be very strong. So here's a property that's currently available. This property is rent ready. It's already rented and it's already producing a monthly income. There's also an incentive for our clients who are looking at this property where we are offering six months free property management and a 1% closing cost concession with a full price offer. So um, with a property like this one at 98.9, we have a down payment of 25% and you guys will find that that's what our calculator is going to default to because you're generally gonna see more favorable returns at 25%, not only from a cash flow perspective, but also on the financing side, you're going to see a more favorable rate and loan term if you kick in that extra 5%. Uh, but do keep in mind that 20% is the minimum down payment for a rental property. So your next box is going to be your gross rent on this property. Remember, it's already rented. So this isn't even an estimate. This is an actual number. This property is rented at 825. Here's your taxes, insurance, um, there's no HOA, no utilities or landscaping in a single family home. Your tenants are going to be responsible for that. So at the end of the day, after your fixed expenses, you're going to be bringing in $285.68 from this property. Now, and we're going to get into what this estimate means in a couple of slides, but these estimates, these are your variable expenses. This is where we're going to account for future maintenance, future vacancy, and the leasing fee. Now your leasing fee is going to be half of one month's rent or in Clarksville, it's a flat rate of 450 and we're gonna divide that over 18 months because on average, you're gonna find yourself with a vacancy every 18 months. Um, of course, your tenants are going to be signing 12 month leases. So what, that's, what that is, is it's um, an estimate over owning a property for 15 years and how many times you may or may not end up having to turn that property to put a new tenant in. So after your variable expenses, here is your estimated monthly cash flow. Now, again, remember that these estimates, these 13% of rent for vacancy and maintenance are not going to be monthly recurring proper, uh, expenses. So let's look at what that return looks like. So we're going to start here with cash on cash return. This is a very easy um, calculation. We're going to take your annual net cash flow over what you invested in this property to purchase it. So we put down 29,917, our annual net cash flow after fixed expenses. All right. So this is your cash flow after you've paid your principal interest, taxes, insurance, and property management. So when those fixed expenses that recur monthly have been paid, your cash on cash return is 11.46%. So that means you've had no maintenance, nothing's gone wrong. All you've done is collected rent for that month and um, and, and you're in, in tall cotton as they say. So let's look at what the cash on cash return looks like when we do total expenses so total expenses are going to include everything we just discussed also vacancy also maintenance also that leasing fee and 
property management. Now, property management, we put in parentheses because we do have some clients who choose to try to manage their own properties, in which case you will not experience a leasing fee. Um, but we're going to talk about the difference between hiring a professional and doing it yourself a little bit later in the uh, presentation. So now let's look at... Oh, Something happened with my annual net cash flow number. Well, I can tell you that my annual net cash flow number after we account for variable expenses is somewhere in the 550 to 600 range. I don't remember exactly, but um, when we take that number via our cash invested, then we're gonna see a much lower cash on cash return at 1.85%. You can see both of those numbers here and we want to show you both of those because there's a lot of ways to evaluate your properties. There's a lot of calculators out there and there's a lot of people out there doing different blogs and podcasts showing the general public how to evaluate properties. There's no right way, there's no wrong way, but you always want to account for any future expenses you're going to have because you may go, if you buy a new property, you may go two years, three years without seeing any major maintenance item but i guarantee if you own a property for 10 years 15 years 20 years you're going to start replacing the roof you're going to start replacing air conditioning units and water heaters and those expenses need to be accounted for so you'll see those accounted for here in our website and again if you feel that our estimates are too high if 13 percent maintenance is too high for you or if 13 percent vacancy is too high for you i highly encourage you to manipulate the calendar to make those numbers work for you where you're more comfortable um, making that decision all right so let's switch gears here um, we're going to look at the san antonio market now again a very steady market in terms of you know stability in home prices and um, market ver uh, volatility there hasn't been very much the most you can see on your screen the most home values dropped even during the crash in 2008 9 and 10 was 2.29 percent so very low volatility which is you know why a lot of cl our clients love the san antonio area as well however you'll see down here in the uh, property class scale, the median home price in this market is about $100,000 higher than it is in Clarksville. So this market is going to be for a different kind of investor with a different financial goal and different means of purchasing. So let's hop in and look at a property. Here is a duplex located in Seguin, a little bit west of San Antonio, um, still covered by our market, part of our management um, coverage. And these duplexes are, are phenomenal. They're brand new builds, which means we're going to see less maintenance and less vacancy on these. Um, in fact, I can already see that I forgot to reduce the maintenance on this snapshot to 5% of the rent instead of 8%. And that's because with a new construction, we can safely assume that there's going to be less maintenance items for the first five years than there would be on a property that's pre-owned, that's pre-lived in. So, that being said, um, you have the same financial snapshot. We've, for a duplex, defaulted to a 30% down payment. Uh, do though keep in mind that for a multi-unit property, 25% is gonna be your minimum down payment. Uh, but just the same as a single family, with 30% down, you are gonna see a more favorable return and a more favorable rate in terms of your loan, if you are financing. So we'll jump down here to the returns. And this time we're gonna talk about return on investment. So our monthly income here, 486.71. Again, we're gonna have those same estimated numbers for vacancy and maintenance. And here we have our 15 year ROI of 17.25%. So how did we get there? Let's take a look. Return on investment is going to be a, a little bit more of a complicated, um, equation because we're taking more numbers into consideration so we're going to look at the total profit from a sale remember we're we're doing a 15-year hold here and the cash invested over that amount of time so here's where you'll you'll find all of that information on the financial calculator so here's our accumulated cash flow and remember this is going to be after variable expenses 
right? Because that's where we found the negative forty eight dollars in our um, in our pro forma. Um, Appreciation is going to be here at two hundred ninety three thousand. Principal pay down, selling expenses of sixty thousand. So total projected profit. Here's where we get the number three nineteen seventeen and fourteen cents. So all of these numbers, and we call that for short CAPE, right? Cash flow C, appreciation A, principal pay down P, selling expenses E, expenses. So here's your total projection from the sale. Your total cash invested at 30% was 123,277. We're assuming a 15 year hold. And that's where we get to our 17.25% return on investment. Now, if you'd like to see what that looks like, if you hold the property for more time or less time, you can see how and if any the, of these numbers change if you go into the years held and adjust that number. Um, some people want to see what it looks like after they've held it for 30 years and have paid off the mortgage or, you know, what if something happens and they may want to sell in five years or 10 years or whatever. You can change that number so that you can see how it affects your overall return on investment. So not to exclude my own market, I am an Orange County local, born and raised in the area. I've uh, lived here my entire life, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to bring up um, another property here, kind of show you the snapshot of Orange County. Looks a little bit more like a Knott's Berry Farm roller coaster in terms of market volatility. Um, however, since about 2013, when everything kind of um, you know, stabilize, we have seen the same kind of steady growth and appreciation that most of us Californians know um, and have kind of grown to expect. Um, California as a state is a very popular place for people to move to, Orange County especially and LA County have a lot of, you know, popularity when it comes to people moving into the state and taking up residency here, whether it be primary or rental. So here's a property here um, located in Laguna Hills, um, actually one of the lower price point for this area of Orange County, uh, priced here at 710. Um, and Orange County in general is going to be more of a appreciation type market. I am showing you guys here a cash pro forma as in my experience, when it comes to people buying rental properties in California, if they have the cash, it makes a lot more sense to pay the pay cash for the property, start collecting rent, kind of get that rental up and going, and then in the future, look into the option of some kind of HELOC or cash out refinance so that they can place that money elsewhere. So I'm showing you guys a cash pro forma here. Estimated rent for this area uh, where this property is located is about $2,500. Um, no HOA, again, utilities and landscaping are gonna fall on the tenant as far as their responsibility. And so here's what this uh, property is going to look like. You will see your return on investment is a little lower here, but that's gonna happen with a cash purchase. Um, and you'll be able to see that when you plug this in or look this property up on the financial calculator. Um, your return on investment does um, get lower when you are financing the entire deal, right? When you, when you get financing from a lender and you're putting in a lower dollar amount and your tenant is paying your loan back for you, you do tend to see that higher return on investment. So here's a little... Um, California property for you guys. I know some out there are more interested in investing in their own backyard. So this could be something, um, you know, that would draw a strong tenant. There's good schools in the area. It's in a nice little suburban area, close to shopping, close to the freeway. Um, definitely fits in the mold for the types of properties most of our clients are looking for. Um, the same type, the same Thing is going to ring true for those Seguin duplexes that I showed and also the single family home I showed everybody in Clarksville. So, all right, start to finish on an analysis. You guys also have the capability on the Marshall Reddick website to find a property on Zillow or Redfin and plug in all those numbers. All you need to know is how much it would rent for, how much the insurance would cost, and how much the taxes are going to be. 
and you can plug all those numbers into the financial calculator yourself and give yourself an idea of how any property is going to perform that you may find on your own and that gives you something to bring to me or to your advisor and say hey Kristen I found this property it looks really good I plug the numbers into the calculator what do you think um, and then we can talk about it we can decide whether or not it looks like it fits with the criteria we've discussed and decide on the next steps from there Here's what that property calculator looks like. You can find that in the learn section on our website. Click calculators and click financial calculator. And this is what you will find. So all those fields will be blank for you. You get to fill them in however you like. Again, the maintenance and vacancy, you can use our numbers from your Reddit property rating ebook, or you can plug in your own that you find more suitable. And then you can be off and running, evaluating the financial performance of your properties as you find them. All right, let's jump into management. This is probably one of the most important pieces of taking care of your property portfolio and making sure that all of your assets are taken care of and you know properly occupied, properly maintained, et cetera. So Marshall Reddick, as I mentioned, has offices in Austin, San Antonio, Clarksville, and Cape Coral. And across those markets this is the structure that you are going to see in some of our third party markets that is going to vary slightly and upon you know our consultation and talking about what market you're interested in and where we want to look we will discuss the differences and nuances between each management company so that you truly understand what it means and what your manager is going to do for you so I get asked all the time, what does my property manager actually do? How am I saving time? How am I saving money by having someone else do all these things for me? So I'm gonna let you guys take a look at this and I'm gonna tell you a real life story. I have a client who owns a property somewhere in Oklahoma. I can't remember exactly what city it is, but you know, one of the larger areas, one of the larger tenant bases, um, you know, had always had success in getting the property rented quickly. And then said client decided that they wanted to start managing the property themselves. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the client lives in California. That's an important piece. So I get a call from this client and he says, you know, Kristen, my property has been vacant for six months. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, six months, that's a long time to have a vacancy. You know, you're, you're paying the mortgage, you're floating this property. And so I ask him, well, who's the property manager? And he says, me. I'll give you guys all a second to think about why his property has been vacant for six months. Who's showing it? Right? That's the number one question. Who's going to show it? Is he going to fly out to Oklahoma every time he wants to show that property to someone who may be a potential tenant? Um, who's fielding who's fielding the calls? Who's dispatching vendors? Who's, you know, getting all that stuff done while he's in California working his 40 plus hour a week regular job? Um, so and aside from just collecting the rent from your tenant on a monthly basis, your management company really is an essential part of getting your property performing and keeping it performing um, so that you don't have to think about it. My husband and I own properties in Arizona, Tennessee, Florida, and Indianapolis. I don't manage any of those and I have no desire to manage any of those because I enjoy my job and I like what I do here and I don't want to field calls about a plumbing issue from Indianapolis or you know about an air conditioning problem in Florida. I don't want to hear about that. I want my managers to take care of it. I'm going to pay them 7 or 8% per month to do so and they're going to make sure that my applicants are solid. They're going to make sure that my tenants can pay the rent and meet all the qualifications and then I don't have to think about it and then I truly do have a passive asset. I'm collecting monthly rent without having to do very much. And in turn, I get to continue to do what I wanna do here in California. So if you have questions about property management and you wanna learn more about it and talk in some more detail, I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, again, 
I highly recommend, even if you live around the corner from your property, um, I highly recommend, you know, speaking with a professional property manager and finding out um, the value that they can bring to the table. So that can you can get a little bit less off your plate and start to enjoy that income instead of having to continue to work for it. So here's a quick snapshot of what sets Marshall Reddick Real Estate apart from some other management companies out there. Um, we've worked with a lot of them. A lot of our clients and employees have experience with a lot of management companies out there. And so that really gave us some insight as to how we wanted to set up our management and what we wanted to offer our clients and how we wanted to do things the same and how we wanted to do a few things differently. So I'll let you guys take a look at this. And really at the end of the day, it comes down to what you as an investor want. Do you want to pay less and get less service? Or do you want to pay a little more for better service? A lot of management you know, teams out there will say, oh, I'll offer you a discounted rate or um, you know, when, when you tell them you're gonna leave, they offer to drop your percentage. Well, that often drops the amount of time that they spend on you because you're not paying as much as all the other clients who are paying the standard 8%. Um, I will also say that the property management average across the nation is about 10%. So if you do find a company out there who's um, charging seven or 8%, um, you're getting a great deal on that management. And, you know, highly recommend that you ask them some questions, find out what they do, find out what other services they offer you so that you can make the decision on who to employ to take care of your assets. All right, so I've told you guys about all the wonderful things that come into play when you invest in real estate. As an investor myself, I definitely stand behind real estate as a strong way to build net worth, get yourself towards financial freedom. However, all investments are going to come with risk. Real estate is not excluded. So there are some things that you will need to be careful for. There are some things that are going to be risky about real estate investing. But the good news is there are ways to try to mitigate some of these risks. And here's what that looks like. Um, as I mentioned before, we can try to mitigate vacancy by purchasing a property where there's a lot of people, where there's a large tenant pool, hiring a professional property manager to make sure that those vacancies are turned very quickly. Um, again, with maintenance, new construction, something that's been renovated or rehabbed, uh, we always wanna get a building inspection so that from roof to foundation, a third party set of eyes is looking at that property and will give you a really in-depth examination of what the condition is. Um, we wanna have at least 20 to 30% down so that we can ensure that we're financially benefiting from the property. Um, there were a lot of defaults back in 2008 because people were putting no money down on their properties. All you had to do was, hey, Mr. Lender, look, I just fogged a mirror. Can you finance me on this property? And by the way, I have no money to put down on it. And your lender would say, sure, come on into my office and have a seat. So that's not the case anymore. Lending guidelines are much more stringent. So not only is there much less of a chance that a borrower is going to overextend themselves, but the requirement for a down payment is such that it gets you to a position where you're more likely to cash flow and thus more likely to hedge yourself against any real negative impact if the value of that property does happen to fluctuate. Um, and finally, your insurance coverage is going to help protect you against any of those unforeseen circumstances such as natural disasters, people getting hurt on your property, et cetera. So we have a lot of educational articles um, on our website, everything from insurance and lending and you know management that we've kind of discussed a little bit on this presentation in addition to webinars about areas in specifics, um, how to borrow money, how to lend money, um, and everything in between. There are webinars and recorded videos for those of you who prefer to watch something. There's things that you can read 
and graphs and charts and all kinds of things for every learning style and everything that you are interested in learning more about. You can find that on the Learn page. You can look at our reviews online. Um, online presence is really important, um, especially you know, when you work in a referral-based business. Our clients tell their friends about the experience, whether it's good or bad, and that has a huge impact on what we do and how many people we're able to help. So I definitely encourage you to check out our reviews, see who you're working with. Um, it also gives you a way to get an idea of what other people think about the person that you're gonna work with or who they've advised that you give a call to. So check out our reviews and um, let's talk about what's next. So if you are interested in taking the next step, um, I would highly recommend scheduling a consultation with myself or if you have an advisor that you're already working with, um, definitely reach out to them um, and have a conversation, whether it's you're just getting started or you're looking at purchasing another property or maybe you're considering selling one of your properties. It's always nice to bounce ideas off of somebody who has some experience who can kind of be an independent non-partial third party to really help you kind of sort through your ideas and what you are what you're thinking what you're considering so here's my information here i can be reached via call text email whatever you guys prefer um, your method of communication works for me as well um, definitely get that consultation scheduled if you'd like to have a conversation learn more all of the above. Again, here's a quick snapshot of what that consultation looks like. We're gonna talk about your unique goals, your financial situation, what it is that you're hoping to do. If you're a high income salaried individual, are you looking for the tax break? Are you 30 years away from retirement? So you're looking for something you can hold on to for, a, for the long term. Are you close to retirement and looking to beef up your monthly income. There's a lot of different things that people are looking for and we wanna make sure that we talk about that, figure out what's gonna work best for you and then get the team involved so that we can help make that a smooth streamlined transaction for you. Uh, again, why is that consultation important and why is it important to make a plan? Because that plan is gonna be the start and the stepping stones to creating your own personal roadmap so that maybe in 10 years or 15 years, your property portfolio and your, you know, kind of roadmap to success, as they would say, may look something like this, where you've done some purchases, you've done some sales, you've um, maybe done a couple of loans, maybe you've, um, you know, partnered and maybe you're looking at something larger, um, whatever the case may be, whatever, you know, in our consultation and in our communication, we decide is the best next steps, first steps, um, whatever that looks like for you. Eventually, we want to help our clients get to the point where their portfolio starts to look like this one, where they can continue to grow and continue to take those steps toward that financial freedom that all of us are looking for. Um, I think at the end of the day, whether your goal is cash flow now, cash flow later, having an asset, depreciating on your taxes, you know, whatever your short-term or long-term goal is, I think at the end of the day, we are all looking for the ability to be financially free. And this is definitely a piece to, to that puzzle to help get you there. So I wanna thank all of you guys for sticking around. I know we're a good 30 minutes over the anticipated time that uh, you thought you were gonna be here today. So for those of you who are left, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sticking with us and for joining us today. I want to thank Tony Watson and Robert Holland Associates for always providing superior tax information and consultations to our clients as well. Here is my information at the bottom of your screen. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And I look forward to speaking with each and every one of you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And until next time, thank you again. And we'll see you guys very soon.